Energy Media readers, we've got a very interesting Zafi today because we're going to be talking to Derek Fildebrand, former Wild Rose MLA, and uh, a, a, uh, I don't even know what to call him anymore, but uh, a publisher of the Western Standard Online for sure, but he's been involved in conservative politics for a number of years in Alberta, and a bit of a firebrand, I guess we'll call him. There you go. Uh, so Derek, welcome to the Zafi. Well, thanks for having me. Uh... First time listener, first time uh, contributor. We'll see if it's the last time. We'll, we'll see. Uh, so look, I mean, yesterday uh, the uh, a press release was issued by the Wexit Group and the Freedom Conservative Party, which you founded uh, prior to the uh, 2019 Alberta election. And they're going to merge and uh, promote the idea of a uh, Alberta separation or secession from Canada. And I, I understand, I, I would imagine that you're more or less supportive of that. So I wanted to get your views on this because I asked Peter Downing and, and the other fellow uh, whose name I've forgotten at the moment, but anyway, I've asked, I asked them for an interview and, and uh, they didn't get back to me. Surprise, surprise. So let's start. Why don't you give me your general take on the merger? Well, um, it, it, Something funny about Alberta political parties, it's actually uh, easier to register a new political party at the federal level than uh, at the provincial level in Alberta. You actually need uh, a ton of signatures in Alberta to register a political party, whereas federally you can, you can do it pretty quickly. Um, but despite the barriers to registration, new parties do pop up from time to time in Alberta, and there's a bit of a cottage industry of them. Um, what's happened here is... I mean, there, there's still, uh, you know, it's one chapter out of 99 of this potential new party to be written. So it's obviously too early to say, but it has the potential to disrupt the strict du uh, federalist duopoly in Alberta, if you will. There's only two parties represented in the legislature representing uh, the broad center right and the broad center left. And that's, that's really it. Um, I mean, there's, uh, people are going to, debate so i have a dog scratching that's what that noise is in the back there um you know people are going to debate what levels there are for sovereignty in alberta but uh it's certainly I, I think we would probably both agree it is higher than is represented in the legislature which is zero in the legislature and uh, and has at least some significant if still uh minority support among albertans and uh, I, I think what these parties are doing, there's a constellation of sovereigntist parties in Alberta of uh, different levels of stridency and, and ideological purity, if you will. But um, there's a constellation of them. And uh, the, there's been conversations going on virtually since the last election on if uh, these parties want to be relevant. Uh, and that would mean uh, coming together. And if there's one thing uh, separatists have a hard time doing, it is uniting. <laughs> it's, uh, they're, they're naturally uh, very individualistic. They like to do their own thing. And so it's, it's, it's particularly, a uh, particularly difficult group to, uh, to unite. Uh, they, they seem to have done so now. Uh, it's still far too early to say what's really gonna come of it. Now, I'm, I'm glad you pointed out the irony of uh, separatist parties uniting and merging. That uh, has produced a few chuckles on Twitter by, uh, by the look of it. Uh, but I also want to uh, focus in on a comment you made about uh, the parties wanting to be relevant. Because, you know, I, I spent some time, uh, I'm on the Wexit mailing list. I can't believe they still send me emails, but they do. So I get to see the conversations that they're having, the Freedom Conservative Party is having. And I'm doubtful, I'm very skeptical that the kind of political culture that those folks are bringing to the table is likely to be relevant even in, in conservative Alberta. I see all sorts of conspiracy theories and uh, say non-evidence-based arguments uh, being made on Facebook pages and so on. So what's your take on that? Can this make Alberta great again sort of approach uh, catch on with the rest of uh, Alberta? Well, it depends if, it, uh, if this new party is able to develop political maturity. Uh, I actually agree with you that if it's a matter of peddling conspiracy theories, um, you know, or, or things that are far, that far outside the mainstream, uh, then it's not going to go anywhere. Uh, similarly, if, uh, if the party 
is as most of the small parties are in Alberta, essentially a political bridge club where the party exists on the board and not very far outside of that. It's not going to go anywhere. Um, you know, Wexit is not a uh, political party in the traditional sense. Uh, it is. It started as a movement, largely a social media movement. Uh, you know, I think everyone's familiar with how significantly it blew up after the last federal election. Uh, it seemed to have the right message at the right time to attract people. But then I think the question became, well, what's next? And uh, and, and people started looking around and seeing that uh, it's not really going to go anywhere if it's just sloganeering and billboards. And uh, so it, what's going to be necessary is uh, if the two parties vote in their referendum to merge, and it seems likely they will, uh, that new party is going to require... Um, an interim leader and then an eventual permanent leader and a board that bring a sense of political maturity to it that is not going to be chasing uh, silly silly rabbit holes. Uh, it's going to face very much the similar challenges that the Wild Rose Party and the Alberta Alliance faced when they merged around 2008. They had, similar to this, they had one MLA before the 2008 election. They lost it in a Tory sweep. I suppose that's a bit of a parallel with myself. Uh, then they came together and they were two small, tiny parties that weren't taken seriously, but then they started to develop a degree of political maturity that attracted reasonable leadership, and then the rest was history with the original Wild Rose Party. This new party is probably going to need to do the same thing if it's going to break into relevancy. Do you have any plans to run for the leadership of the party or be involved in any way? Absolutely not. I, uh, I think the saying goes, if, uh, if nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. Uh, I'm not going to run for dog catcher. I have no interest in ever running in politics again. It's, uh, it's something I don't think is really for me, but you know, in, I, I, I'm supportive of uh, the most strongly pro Alberta party you can get that'll assert uh, uh, either equality for uh, constitutional reform for equality for Alberta within Canada or solve, if that's not possible, then sovereignty for Alberta outside. And I'd like to see a credible option for that. That, uh, that isn't dominated by corporatist crony capitalism that, uh, that, that seems to unfortunately dominate much of the UCP. So I, I, I'm happy to advise and, uh, you know, and be supportive in the background, but I have no intention of ever seeking office. I, I want to I pose a hypothesis to you, and I think this will uh, get to the root of the angst that's led to the formation of these parties, and that is the approach to oil and gas and pipelines and the perception in Alberta of oil and gas and pipelines. And my hypothesis, my pitch to you, my argument to you is in fact that the uh, Alberta's place within Confederation and the current federal government has actually been pretty supportive of oil and gas. And the problems around pipelines are not because anybody wants to kill pipelines. In fact, the three pipelines that are uh, currently under construction, according to the Canadian Energy Regulator, will uh, handle all of Alberta's growth and supply in 2040 to the next, for the next 20 years. And Alberta hasn't been treated nearly as poorly as it likes to think. And therefore, if that's the case, then that really does cut undercut the argument uh, that you just laid out and in for the formation of these parties. So that's my hypothesis. Back to you, sir. Uh, well, surprise, surprise, I, I don't agree with it, but, uh, but I can see where you're coming from. I, I don't think that the liberals are as, uh, you know, I don't think they're sitting around like Mr. Burns openly planning the imminent demise of Alberta's oil and gas industry. I can understand why people might think so, but it's, I, I don't think that is the case, but I do think they are, they view it as, um, the liberals and I think to a general degree, uh, the Laurentian consensus in general uh, for most of Canada's history has always looked down upon natural resource extraction. Uh, the, the embarrassment of uh, Canadians being drawers of water and hewers of wood, that it's somehow below us, that as a first world country, we should be manufacturing or in the new economy as they call it. And there's nothing wrong with those things, but I think there is, there is a tendency in much of the Laurentian consensus, which I think dominates the Liberal Party, but has significant influence within the Conservative Party as well, that that is an embarrassment that uh, natural resource, uh, direct natural resource extraction uh, is somehow below a first world country. And the Liberals, 
I, I think it's undeniable, are captured at least in part, uh, not to the same extent as the NDP or, God forbid, the Greens, but they are captured in part by uh, the modern left green movement, which views fossil fuel uh, industry and extraction as naturally evil, uh, that it is a moral wrong. And so I, I think the, the liberals uh, feel guilty about it, but they're more pragmatic than the Greens or the NDP. They realize that they can't flick a switch and kill it tomorrow, that uh, that, that would uh, probably trigger an exodus of Alberta, Saskatchewan, maybe others, and that it would send the Canadian economy into a tailspin. It's just not practical. But I, I, I think that a lot of people in Alberta give the Conservatives a pass on these things. The Conservatives were not nearly as good for Alberta as they often get a pass for, simply because they're the home team, because we identify the Conservatives as the home team of the West. The Conservatives get a pass for things and the Liberals get, uh, get, no, get no credit whatsoever. So I, it's a way of saying uh, the Liberals aren't as bad as people think and the Conservatives aren't as good as people think. Okay, well, let me, let me put another uh, uh, idea to you, which is that, in fact, this isn't about the Laurentian elites at all, and I recognize the Buffalo Declaration argument and what you're saying, which I have come out editorially against and opposed. And it, really what's going on here is fundamental structural shifts in markets. I mean, you're a free market conservative. You like, you like capitalism. You like markets. And what we're seeing is uh, a move in uh, two fronts. One is the global energy system being transformed by new technologies that have been gestating for 20, 30, 40 years, and I'm talking uh, wind and solar and electric vehicles, but there are thousands of other of these technologies, and they're fundamentally changing the way the industry and the world thinks about uh, energy and also climate change. I mean, there is a climate crisis going on. The science is, is very clear, and what you're, and we see even, uh, you know, Wall Street uh, with uh, its concerns about climate risk uh, is less almost unwilling to invest in oil and gas, especially high in, in emissions intensity oil and gas because of climate risk. And these are big structural changes that aren't going away. They aren't related just to politics. They aren't related just to policy implemented by the Laurentian elite or any other elite. And Alberta is sticking its head in the sand. And these two parties that we're talking about are the lead ostriches. So your response, sir. Uh, I think there's some things in what you've said that I can agree with. Uh, there are changes in the market. There are developing technologies and their new technologies are always disruptive within the market. It's creative destruction and capitalism and it's, a, it's an inevitable and necessary force. Uh, that being said, I think there, there is a difference between new technologies uh, disrupting things on their own, say an Uber coming in and then governments uh, mandating new technologies. That's direct government and state intervention uh, to force things upon people. When, uh, you know, when in Ontario, they have the government subsidizing uh, high-end Teslas, or if you have, uh, you know, the previous government here in Alberta trying to force wind and solar, even against, um, even though they, they would uh, generally be more expensive and less reliable than traditional sources of energy. But there are new sources of energy coming in. They're going to be disruptive. And, uh, and we would be ignorant to put our heads in the sand and say that is not, not a real thing. Uh, I, you know, some companies might be concerned with, uh, you know, with, with the, the global warming side of things. But at the, at the end of the day, um, I, I don't think that particularly prices in other than the political aspect that's baked into the price. Uh, if they're worried that governments in a jurisdiction excuse me, uh, are going to uh, try to disrupt an industry because of their emissions. Um, so I, I, th I think the primary problems, the, uh, especially pre-COVID and the Russian-Saudi uh, oil war here, most of the, a large measure of these problems are directly caused by government intervention. Uh, some of them made at home here. Uh, I mean, I, the insane policy of uh, continued oil curtailment, essentially oil supply management, which is the fault of both the NDP and the UCP in Alberta here, which both agreed upon it. Um, and also uh, actions from Ottawa, uh, British Columbia, and, uh, and Quebec. Uh, these things do matter. They are major impediments. They've made us a bit of a joke in the, in the world oil markets here. Uh, and, and the evidence to that, uh, without trying to oversimplify it too much, is 
uh, while Alberta has been struggling in recent years, we can look south of the border to Montana, the Dakotas, to Texas, Oklahoma, and we can look at the strength of the oil industries in those jurisdictions, which have the same price of oil as us. Uh, they face many of the same challenges other than the political hurdles. Well, as an energy journalist, I, I can't resist the opportunity to respond to that because it's essentially wrong. Your fact, the evidence doesn't support you. The data doesn't support you. Expert opinion doesn't support you. Well, how, how so? Well, I'm going to tell you. So if you look at the uh, Canadian Energy Research Institute uh, released a study uh, a month ago that showed it was about regulatory competitiveness in Canada and the United States. And it showed that on day-to-day -day regulation of the oil and gas industry, there is no difference between Texas, North Dakota, Oklahoma, pick a state, and Canada. They're the energy regulator in Alberta, the BC Oil and Gas Commission, all of the kinds of regulation that they do are comparable in terms of uh, efficiencies and, and cost to the American jurisdiction. So there's a reputable, uh, a reputable institution, a think tank, that has done a study of it and disproved all of that argument. Where there is a difference is on regulatory approval, review and approval of uh, uh, pipelines and LNG projects. So for the average increase in, in uh, review time in the US, uh, or sorry, in Canada versus the US is 13 months for pipelines, 19 months for LNG. Well, in Canada, we have a much more complex uh, uh, regulatory approval system because we have uh, Section 35, and we have a, a constitutional obligation to consult Indigenous peoples, and they have won legal challenges that have delayed the Trans Mountain expansion, for example, and we can't get around that. We have to go through the process, and it takes more time than the Americans, and that's just the price of being a Canadian and doing the things and respecting rights and, and stuff that we put in the Constitution. Now, as for the relative strength of the American economy, you must be kidding, Derek. The U.S. shale basins are in the process of imploding. They, uh, they have been, many of the shale, base, shale companies, especially the smaller independents, were never financially viable. They were kept alive by Wall Street Capital. Uh, and, the, uh, and now that the price has dropped, I mean, they haven't been viable for the past, since December of 2018, when Wall Street uh, said to the shale, bay, shale producers, thou shalt get no more capital, you must live on your cash flow. They have been dropping like flies, and since the price has gone down, the, basically the Permian and other, and other basins are uh, collapsing. And we just had uh, economist Ed Hurst from the University of Houston on here uh, two weeks ago, uh, Zafi, who explained in detail the, the bad economics of, uh, of the shale basin, why they in fact were, <clears throat> were likely to fail and the production was going down. The service sector is gutted in the US. They're, they're cutting up rigs for scrap. They're park, they, you know, they're, they've parked rigs and other equipment all over the place. So essentially, sir, the evidence and the data doesn't support your argument. Well, actually, I, you haven't actually cited much specific specifically, but I actually don't think we disagree as much as you might be thinking. The American oil industry, like the Canadian oil industry or gas industry, is not a monolith. Uh, there are the conventional producers, there are the heavier producers, and there are shale. And shale has been getting the, the crap kicked out of it for some time, uh, as you said. Uh, they've been the target of the Russians and Saudis for a long time. They've, they've had a target on their back for about six years, at least. Uh, uh, because they've been obviously cutting into the marketplace. Um, uh, on, on the pure regulatory side, I don't think you're, you're incorrect. Uh, but, pipe, and pipe, but it's pipelines that is killing, um, killing approvals in, in Canada. It does take longer, sometimes for good reasons, uh, but sometimes for very bad. And we actually don't know how long pipelines are going to take under the new regulatory process. So the uh, much longer times that you cited, that was under the old process, which uh, most reasonable observers expect is going to be shorter than the new process. Under the new process, uh, it's highly unlikely that you're going to see many major international or interprovincial pipelines uh, applications come forward again. And we don't know how long those are going to take if anybody even bothers doing so under, uh, under the new legislation. Uh, but the Americans, particularly in conventional and heavy oil, they have less heavy oil. They have been more competitive than us. Because
Sorry, could you oh. uh, unmute your mic, please? Oh, sorry. Uh, the Americans have been, uh, especially in, in conventional and unconventional, have been more competitive uh, than than Canada's and Alberta's conventional and and, and heavy oil uh, because they have had better access to market. Uh, but you know, the otherwise domestic regulatory issues around approvals uh, for development, you are correct, are not that uh, dissimilar from Canada, but they have had much less problems getting their products to market. And, and that is a part of the dysfunction of the Canadian uh, federal system. And, uh, you know, don't mistake me for some wild eyed separatist who uh, just hates everything about the rest of Canada and wants out for the sake of it. Uh, I was born a Canadian. And I preferably wish to die a Canadian, uh, but I, I don't believe that any people should be uh, existing in a politically unequal system that does not treat their votes equally, that does not treat them constitutionally equally, and can disregard them as simply not important, can take their money and can simply otherwise disregard them. And so that's why I've always believed that the best course for Alberta and the West is constitutional reform and equality within a united Canada. I just don't believe that that is politically possible anymore, which is why sovereignty uh, has, needs to become a viable option. Uh, Derek, I'm gonna, this is going to be the final question that you and I are going to talk about, and then we'll open it up to, to Q&A. So if everybody can make sure that they keep their, their mics muted and, until, I, uh, until we get to the Q&A portion, that would be great. Thank you. So I, I, take, I take issue with your, your contention that, that somehow Alberta, and again, this is the Buffalo Declaration argument you're giving us, and I think that even most Albertans, uh, there's a reason why nobody's talking about the Buffalo Declaration these days, is because frankly, it's not a credible argument. The, credit, the, the evidence and the data doesn't uh, su uh, support that claim that Canada, that Alberta has somehow been victimized by Alberta, or by, by Canada. I mean, we had the national policy that started in 1885, where yes, you know, Ontario and Quebec's factories got markets in the West, and in return, we sent uh, resources out, out, uh, out east. That was the bargain. But, you know, things have changed substantially since 1905. And that doesn't, that doesn't uh, hold anymore. I mean, our trade is north-south with the Americans. And it's primarily oil and gas or manufactured products uh, tied to the oil and gas industry. And this idea that somehow, you know, Alberta has been denied its, uh, its e an equal voice, its equality, it's being treated as a as a colony is, is the argument that I hear all the time, I think it was in the Buffalo Declaration, is simply nonsense. I mean, we just, the prime minister before Trudeau was from Alberta and he was the prime minister for, you know, 10 years and, and I did so, and he, and he did all sorts of things that hurt Alberta, like the, the income trust uh, changes. And, and uh, where, according to your argument, when you have an Alberta prime minister, you should have all sorts of policy that would favor Alberta, and he brought in SIA 2012. No, that is not my argument. Well, okay, fine, and you can clarify it in, in a moment. But I, I think Alberta has fared really well under, uh, under Confederation. In fact, the primary failure that we see here is Alberta politicians, federal politicians, are really crappy at politics. The industry is crappy at politics. It doesn't go and form alliances. It doesn't look for partners in other parts of the province and bring them on board in kind of a coalition to support the, the policy that it, that it needs. It thumps its chest, makes demands, and look at, look at what CAP did in the recent <clears throat> negotiations around, around the uh, COVID-19 support. It had a long list of, uh, that was a, it was a laundry list of relaxation of environmental regulations and nothing else. And it had 29 meetings, lobbying meetings with ministers, and it fell on deaf ears because read the room, guys. That was just not ever going to be on. And that is the way industry and many Alberta politicians conduct themselves. They think that because it's the biggest industry in, in, the, in Canada, the biggest export industry, that when it wants something, it should be given something. And it does, it's that, I'm sorry, but in a confederation, that doesn't fly. And that leads to a lot of the frustrations. And so I would posit to you, sir, that the problem is that Alberta is shit at politics. Your response, please. Well, I don't think you're incorrect on that last part. Uh, I might be particularly shit at politics too. But, um, you know, there are industries in Canada that are not as big as the oil and gas industry. And when they want something, they get it. You have companies like Bombardier that are essentially permanent corporate welfare cases. You have uh, GM and Chrysler a decade ago 
uh, which were incredibly uncompetitive, making cars nobody wanted, paying far too much, and uh, and and based extremely uh, based on wildly uh, unrealistic, uh, you know, pension projections, etc. And when those went down, uh, the federal government came cup in hand, and all every single party. Uh, agreed to it, including the Tories, which is the moment when I stopped being a federal conservative. I stopped being a federal conservative when they bailed up the auto industry. Um, look, simply having a prime minister from Alberta actually didn't do particularly much for the West because we have low expectations generally. Those expectations might be beginning to change right now. Um, the Alberta and the West in general, but Alberta in particular, our expectations of the federal government are so low that we're happy if a federal government doesn't just make things worse. And uh, so we spent 10 years with the Reform Party and Canadian Alliance. We give that up for the Conservative Party of Canada. They water down virtually all the West wants in stuff to come to power. And what do we get? We got rid of the wheat board, which was good. Uh, we got rid of the long gun registry, which was good. And that was effectively it for the West. We got nothing else. Uh, we got uh, the same e equalization formula that we have today under Justin Trudeau was written while Stephen Harper and Jason Kenney sat around the cabinet table. Uh, so I think you're sorely mistaken if you mistake me for some conservative apologist who thinks that everything is fine when the conservatives are in power. I'm not a conservative. I haven't voted federal conservative for several elections now because I don't think they deserve the support of Westerners, in my view. Clearly, many, many people would disagree with me on that. Uh, but I'm not willing to... They, they, the conservatives take Alberta for granted because they know they're going to win virtually everything no matter what they do. So they do virtually nothing for the West. It's essentially votes in the bag. And the liberals, one of the reasons they do so little for the West is, sorry, I want to think about equal time to respond is the question and statement you had, if that's okay, Mark. Mark oh, I thought we were about equal, but go ahead. Oh, I, I, might be I might be mistaken. But, um, you know, the, the liberals write us off because they know they can't do much here. Their best election ever, they won five seats here and they lost every single one of them. Um, the, uh, the reason no one's talking about the Buffalo Declaration, I think, is because our conservatives are chicken shit for the most part. Uh, when the Buffalo Declaration came out, uh, many conservatives who I believe agree with it uh, came down like a ton of bricks on the four rogue conservatives who put it out uh, because they're, cons they're obsessed with winning votes in the East. And the conservatives, and, and this plays into what I said, the conservatives know they have the West in the bag and they don't want other conservatives stirring up discontent saying that the conservatives need to be doing more for them. I don't believe that Alberta is equal when we have six senators and Nova Scotia by itself has, uh, I think, 10 or 12, uh, or New Brunswick by itself has 10 or 12. Alberta has four times the population of all four, uh, three to four times the population of all four Atlantic provinces, and every single Atlantic province except for Prince Edward Island has significantly more Senate seats than we do. Every single functional federation in the democratic world has an upper house to represent region uh, to represent the provinces of the states or or lander depending on the languages in the country uh, and they're either equal or they give greater weight to the smaller jurisdictions uh, to represent them but in Canada it's completely arbitrary it just depends on what the date was when you joined confederation and so Al Alberta I don't believe is treated fairly in confederation we need a, we need a new constitution to to reform how we do things and if that's not possible, which I don't think is possible, then I think sovereignty is uh, the only practical option left. Well, I'm going to use the moderator's prerogative to respond to that before a little bit, just before we ask uh, Max to ask a question. And that is uh, a couple points. Uh, I have not heard anything that you've said that, could be, could, that couldn't be solved, any grievance that couldn't be resolved with uh, reform or accommodation, which is the Canadian way. And I don't see any of that that supports uh, that supports a cessation as the secession, sorry, as the solution. And furthermore, uh, Trudeau just bought you a, a pipeline, man. It's like I don't want it. I don't want the federal government to own a pipeline. You wanted a pipeline, now you got one, and and that's a lot more than than Bombardier has gotten lately. So anyway, on that note, sir, uh, we're gonna uh, Max, if you could unmute your microphone and ask your question, please. Sure. I, I just want to say, first of all, thank you to to Derek. This I, I'm I am shockingly charmed by you. Uh, I, I I did not expect that. So this is, that's oh. been interesting. Um, I just wanted to say something about the Senate. I'm 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 curious about this because 
you know, it's been this long running fascination for, for certainly, you know, Ted. Oh, ju just a warning. I may have a toddler bursting into my room here. I think her, her, her show has come off. Oh, okay. then you have to, the rule is if the toddler bursts in the room, you have to introduce her just so you know. Uh, did, if it, I, I think we might be about to have a BBC moment here. Okay. <laughs> so, not a problem. so go forward. Uh, but I j just be warned folks that uh, not I might problem. not be alone here. Max. Um, so it, this is, you know, the, the Senate has been a long running issue. I mean, I think we should be clear the composition is not arbitrary. Uh, the composition overweights the Atlantic provinces because without that overweighting, they never would have agreed to confederation. So, you know, I, I think Albertans need to understand that, that it's not, uh, you know, arbitrary or random. It, it, we wouldn't have Canada if it wasn't for the, the weighting in the Senate. But, you know, the Senate is a, is a basically useless institution at this point, um, you know, it doesn't really do much other than occasionally holding up legislation and, and you know, refining it. Uh, why this, this fascination with getting equal weight in the Senate? It feels to me like we're importing an American attitude towards the Senate and an American understanding of its importance, which just doesn't, it doesn't work in this country. Um, yeah, no, the, the Atlantic provinces, you are correct, putting out Max, were, uh, you know, they wanted the Senate as it was. But uh, when Alberta and Saskatchewan were about to come into confederation, there was never a vote among people or even among the local representatives. The premier of the Northwest Territories at the, ta at the time, Frederick Haltane, even proposed that Alberta and Saskatchewan become Buffalo, and that was ignored by the federal government. And so Alberta and Saskatchewan were never, ever asked about what it's going to take for us to join. We were created by an act of parliament, effectively, uh, Ottawa said what the deal is going to be. So there was never a negotiation from our part on what joining Confederation would look like. And I, and I don't think it's any kind of American obsession or American idea of the Senate. It's actually uh, the way most upper houses look in most federations across the democratic world. Saskatchewan has an equal number, sorry, not Saskatchewan, no, Australia has an equal number of senators uh, for each one of their states. Uh, their territories, uh, I think similar to us, their territories get less, but all of their, uh, their, their states, essentially provinces, get the same. In Germany, they, uh, they're different. They, uh, in the Bundeslat, their, their upper house, they, um, their smaller states get more seats in their upper house than their population would warrant, but they get less than the big ones. So it'd be the equivalent here of Ontario gets 10, and Prince Edward Island gets three, and uh, New Brunswick gets five, Alberta gets six. Uh, so it'd be, it'd be a sort of a sliding scale. But most, uh, most federations across the democratic world have a functioning upper house, and it's a key element in ensuring that one region cannot overwhelm the other. And uh, none of these federations have purely appointed representatives coming from the central, uh, the central organs. So. Even, uh, I, I suppose when Harper appointed Alberta senators that had been elected, they were fine. But when Alberta, when Stephen Harper appointed Saskatchewan senators, uh, without meaning to denigrate any of them, they just become representatives of the party. They do nothing for Saskatchewan. Uh, they just represent the party that they're appointed from at the time. And so the, Alberta, the American Senate is elected, the Australian Senate is elected, the German Senate um, is appointed from the bottom up. So the, their states, their lander appoint uh, their equivalent of senators upwards and they change every time their lander or provincial governments change. And so uh, Alberta really is out of, sorry, Canada is really out of step with the way any modern functioning federation should work in its upper house. Okay, uh, there's, we have an answer to Max's question and Zach Trolley, you're up next. If you could unmute your mic and ask your question, please. So there, there's been a lot of talk. I think a lot of the, the Wexit and separation is about um, resources, but I'd like to chat about kind of um, um, other other industries um, and space industry is a, is a big one for me. Um, the space industry gives us mapping, it gives us weather data, it gives us satellite information, all sorts of things. How would an independent Alberta access um, all this high tech information without, um, you know, access to the Canadian Space Agency, but we have um, access to the UN, all these other um, high level issues that re are required for modern society to function. All right, thanks a lot, Zach. Um, well, I, I'm not running for Alberta Premier or President of the Buffalo Republic, so I can't tell you specifically what it would look like. I can I give you my ideas of what it might look like. Uh, you know, 
in, in the hypothetical world where this is successful, Al Alberta or Alberta plus uh, others uh, forms an independent state, I, I think the responsible thing to do for both uh, Alberta or the West and, uh, and the rem remnants of Canada would be to form still a close union, something probably more akin um, to the European Union, a, an organization among sovereign states. Not, not that I'm a fan of the European Union, but it does certainly have positive elements to it that I, I think have been overwhelmed by some of the negative. But uh, the positive elements to the European Union allow them to share resources, have open borders between them. Uh, I, I think it would be extremely unlikely that uh, either Alberta or the remnants of Canada would be uh, in the long term willing to cut off our noses to spite our faces. And so I think you would you would probably see a free trade agreement or even customs union. You'd probably see negotiations on currency. Uh, it is potentially you'd see something like the Canadian Space Agency become shared in Europe. They have the European Space Agency. It's not just the Germans and the French and the Brits, and especially not the Brits, I suppose, but uh, uh, different states acting on their own. Uh, sovereign states have the ability to work together uh, through across uh, multilateral and uh, multinational organizations. And I think any smart settlement in the event uh, that things had uh, progressed to the point of an independent Alberta or West would involve uh, strong multilateral uh, or bilateral uh, ties between them including on, on the space agency. Well, Derek, I have a question for you, and I want to propose it again in the form of a hypothesis. So I think there's a very good chance that by the time uh, Canada and Alberta reached an agreement on separation, and, and I went through all of the constitutional wrangling that would take, we're talking years. I don't think anybody is thinking this would happen uh, overnight. And then mm -hmm. by the time Alberta got its, itself organized, and Let's say that that happens by 2040, just pick a date. Well, there are a lot of observers now who are thinking that L the, we're gonna see peak oil demand in the mid 20s, uh, 2020s, we're going to see the, the demand destruction as they call it in the global oil markets going forward. And I would, I would argue that by 2040, if Alberta continues on the same road it is with its economy without making major changes, in 2040, Alberta needs Canada more than Canada needs Alberta, and it would be foolhardy at this point during a structural change in the biggest industry the province has to abandon the clout and the, and the resources that Canada brings to the table. I, I think that, that uh, the idea that separatists have, that somehow if they just get their hands on the policy levers, they can make the oil and gas industry fabulously prosperous again, and we'll go back to you know the 1990s or pre-2014 and be rolling in money, and then you can fund all of these things that you're talking about. I think exactly the opposite would happen, and you would find that you're in now in a, a sunset industry. There's been no planning for what to do with the you know post-sunset industry, and Canada would have to be there to bail it out, help it restructure, and so on and so forth. Your response, sir? Well. People have been predicting peak oil for uh, for quite a while now. We're supposed to have peak oil in the late 70s. We are supposed to have it again right now. Uh, clearly, we don't have peak oil right now. We have uh, a market that's flooded with it. Uh, at some point, there, you know, oil, the economy is likely to transition from a fossil fuel base uh, energy to something else. But we don't know what that is yet. Uh, the something that is cheap enough and plentiful enough. Uh, to displace uh, hydrocarbons is just not there yet. I believe it will come at some point, but we don't know what it is. It'll come at some point. Uh, but I've never bought in the argument that we're going to need Canada's resources. Alberta has been a net contributor to Canada for the overwhelming majority of its existence. Uh, we're a relatively new province, founded in 1905. Uh, for the vast majority of that, we have been a net contributor to Confederation and uh, particularly post-1950s, a massive, massive over-contributor to it. Um, you know, Alberta would have, uh, I mean, th there's nothing that a, an Alberta government couldn't do uh, that Ottawa can do. They, it's not like they have some special expertise that we don't have here. Uh, and there are plenty of small states around the planet that do extraordinarily well. Switzerland is, uh, you know, 
a, a great example. Switzerland, Alberta is roughly the size of, uh, not exactly, roughly the size of Norway or Sweden or Finland in our, in our populations uh, and even size. Uh, there are many comparable states and no one says that Norway can't govern itself, that Switzerland can't govern itself that Austria can't govern itself. These are all small states, uh, and both Switzerland and Austria are landlocked, but they've managed to successfully work cooperatively with their partners as sovereign states, but they've worked with their partners to be incredibly prosperous jurisdictions. And I've never bought in this that we're incapable of governing ourselves. But again, I'll go back and say, I've always preferred there to be a strong and united Canada, but a reformed Canada uh, that, uh, and not just on the Senate, but that abolishes equalization, puts limits on wealth transfers between jurisdictions, uh, that makes us a fairer, less transactional federation, and one that works as something more resembling a nation state. I do not believe, though, that there is any reasonable hope of reform of the Canadian Federation. Uh, not a single one of the Tory leadership candidates will speak about it. Uh, the only conservatives purely at all that have spoken about it are the four uh, Buffalo MPs. And, uh, and they've been shunned within their own party for trying to upset the Western base. And uh, Ottawa and Quebec and probably the Atlantic provinces would all veto anything that we try to put forward anyway, which, which should say something about the inflexibility of Canadian federalism, that it is more likely that Albertans would obtain uh, independence than they would obtain reform. And that's sad because I think Canada is worth attempting to save. Well, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Max to uh, ask one more question. Max, if you can unmute your uh, mic, please. Yeah, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to ask two questions, but I'll be very quick about it. Uh, I'm curious what Derek thinks uh, would, di would change in terms of Alberta's desire to ship oil off the West Coast if it was, in, if it was an independent state. How would it convince Canada and BC to allow it to build new pipelines across its territory? Um, when there's no longer any common interests uh, at play. And number two, how would it deal with the indigenous population in Alberta that has very clearly said that it has no interest uh, in an independent Alberta? And, and you know, this, this is echoes of Quebec in the 1990s where you know, the, the, the Cree community basically said, if Quebec separates, we're not going with it. So how, I mean, how would you address those two issues? Those are actually really good questions. Uh, questions I've uh, wrestled with quite a bit. Uh, on the BC issue, uh, a lot of people are only thinking of the question uh, one dimensionally, thinking what would uh, the relationship of Alberta be with BC or with uh, the rest of Canada. Uh, key to that is the other dimension of it. What do they want from us? So clearly we would want to ship our products through British Columbia to access the Pacific markets. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if British Columbia didn't want to let us do that, or Canada didn't want to let us do that, it would be problematic. But people aren't thinking about the other side of the equation. If Alberta were independent, British Columbia would be a virtual East Prussia of the rest of Canada. It would be an isolated island. There are no significant ground transportation links that circumvent Alberta through the north. It's just simply not viable. Alberta would have a veto over any products going between British Columbia and Canada and Canada and British Columbia would have, a, it would have uh, the ability to control its airspace. Uh, if they were to engage in a trade war, Alberta could hurt British Columbia far more than British Columbia could hurt Canada because uh, I, I think as you both, uh, you all well know, uh, so much of our trade is north-south, not east-west. Um, it, it is through the United States. Uh, as much as we want to rely more on trade through the rest of Canada, so much of it is north-south. British Columbia absolutely must pass its goods through Alberta and uh, vice versa with the rest of Canada. So the, the logical conclusion is that Alberta as a sovereign state would have a much greater bargaining power to force British Columbia to the table to allow trade through its territory. And if both Canada, Alberta, and British Columbia are acting as rational partners and not trying to uh, simply hurt one another out of revenge, they would come to a reasonable trade agreement uh, to facilitate that. Uh, your second question on indigenous, uh, on, on indigenous peoples within uh, Alberta, that is complicated and no one's actually had a very good answer on either side of this yet. Uh, one side says, well, they say no and that's it, they have a veto. Well, that's not true. But on the other side uh, saying, well, we can vote to go and 
Indigenous communities can't say anything about it. That's also dead wrong. Uh, and there's a lot to look for, as, as you pointed to with the Cree in, uh, in Quebec. Now, Quebec's secession case, uh, I think, was quite different from Alberta. Quebec nationalism is inherently nationalistic, ethnic, and linguistic based. It's a much scarier version of nationalism than a civic nationalism like Alberta. Uh, the closest we get to an ethnic nationalism is a cowboy hat and boots at Stampede, and that's about the extent of it. And you can wear that no matter what your color or what language you speak. Um, so I don't think Alberta nationalism, if you would even call it that, is a particularly scary prospect for people. If you're, if you're a Cree indigenous person in Quebec, you would be scared by the prospect of, a, of an independent ethno -nation, nation state like Quebec. And so they had much greater reasons, I think, to oppose it. Um, but you're right. Uh, Alberta's First Nations have been relatively uninterested in, in broaching this subject. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, we've actually had done quite a, quite a bit of writing on this topic, and we've consulted some of the best policy experts in Canada on it. Uh, and, and they're the broad consensus is uh, First Nations need to be consulted, they need to be a part of it, but ultimately their relationship is with the crown. And there are there are 13 crowns in Canada. There's the federal crown, uh, sorry, there are 11 crowns. There is the uh, the federal crown, and then there are, uh, uh, then there are all of the provincial crowns. Um, and in the event of an independent Alberta, uh, Alberta would simply assume the powers of the federal crown and therefore assume all treaties and responsibilities of the federal crown, both internationally and domestically. Um, so, you know, Alberta simply couldn't up and leave without properly consulting First Nations, respecting all of their treaty rights as they have signed it. Uh, I think there'd be an opportunity to actually open those treaty rights up to give them potentially a greater, a better deal and greater degree of autonomy and self-government, which I think they'd be interested in. But I think they, they are afraid and suspicious of, of a, a new relationship with Crown, uh, with, with the Crown. Um, but at the same time, a small minority of the population cannot veto the will uh, in the event of a, a majority independence vote in Alberta a minority does not get to say that you can't do it simply because they have an agreement. So it is, it is very complicated. It's very messy. Uh, and, and it's not straightforward. And neither side, I think, has presented a, a coherent argument around it. It's something we're looking for funding on right now to, to do a more coherent and comprehensive study on. Okay, well, we're going to wrap up here. And I'm going to, have a, I'm going to say a few uh, comments, uh, Derek, and then we'll let you have the the final word. I have to say, with all respect, I have not been convinced by your arguments. I don't think that there, there is a... I'm terribly surprised. Well, I mean, I, I came in wanting, like, uh, as Max said, you know, you're, uh, you, you've charmed us more than we, we expected, and you've, you've laid out a very, you took a rational approach to this, and kudos to you, sir. I, you know, we've had a, and I think we've had an adult conversation this morning, but nevertheless, you laid out arguments for a whole variety of things, and I happen to, since I, I report on the energy industry, at least I can respond to those. And I will say quite categorically that the evidence and, and your argument don't hold water. I'm not absolutely not convinced. And on the other issues on which I don't report, and so I don't know quite as well, I'm highly skeptical that they will be nearly as easy or as resolvable as you think they are. And I still maintain, and your argument here today has only further convinced me, that Alberta is far, far, far better off remaining in confederation and trying to, if it has problems, it could push for reform. Uh, other provinces have done the same thing. And ultimately, uh, the talk, and here's another, I want to make one last comment. So you came on here and you gave us a rational argument. We disagreed with it. We don't think the evidence supports it. But you gave a rational argument. Much of the Wexit movement is scary. It reminds me of uh, MAGA with the Make America Great Again, and it is full of conspiracy theorists. Its leaders, like Peter Downing, are disreputable rogues. I have no, uh, happy to say that in public, and who uh, trade in conspiracy theories and trade in misrepresentations and, you know, basically whip their followers into a frenzy based on, you know, that people, people are angry. There's angst. I get that. And he taps into that, and that is not the ba the basis. The pro it would never be a basis for a new nation state, and or even a credible political movement. So, 
those are my final comments, sir, and I turn the floor over to you. Uh, well, I've, I've enjoyed it. I didn't expect we'd agree on much other than the time of day, but uh, I think it's important we, we communicate ac across platforms. Uh, maybe we'll invite you to come on the Western Standard uh, video and podcast. Um, we actually have Deirdre Mitchell McLean, who I think is a fan of yours. Uh, she's a senior reporter. Uh, she's not traditional uh, Western Standard leaning uh, reader, but she, we, you know, we, we try to keep our news sides uh, right, right down the center incredible. And so we've got reporters from across the political spectrum there, but uh, perhaps we'll have you on our on our show and and get your perspective. I happily on accept the invitation. Great. Uh, so no, it's it. it I, I didn't expect to to change your mind on this. Uh, I don't think your facts fit uh, your arguments as well on some things, but I I, I suppose. Uh, we can all find facts to fit our own somewhere in the middle. Uh, there's probably a synthesis of things. Uh, but, you know, you can, uh, there's, uh, what is it? Lies, damn lies, and statistics. Cool. So we'll all go find Ooh. our own evidence. <laughs> Quoting ben Benjamin Disraeli to me, sir. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, I will repeat. Uh, well, actually, we'll get into the Wexit thing that you mentioned. And I actually in part agree with you. Um, but you know, the, the independence movement in Alberta or Wexit, because there's, there's many different pieces of it. Um, it is begun as a social movement, not a credible and organized political party, but as a social movement. And uh, as they are on the left and on the right, uh, you know, Occupy Wall Street on the left, uh, you know, had communists and Marxists in it uh, who discredited it. They were you know, is a decentralized movement without a clear political leader and organization, and, uh, and, and that can tarnish that on the left. Or on the right in the United States, you had the Tea Party. Most of those people were probably just run-of-the-mill conservatives and libertarians, but you do have the odd kook there, because these are decentralized movements without some kind of elected leader. Um, the challenge is now to move beyond protest movement and having a couple of angry rallies into tangible, credible political alternative. And most political movements start this way. Uh, they, you know, they start as an angry rabble who generally agree on what they dislike with a very vague idea of what they do want at the end of it. And, the, and this movement is not guaranteed to go anywhere. It's gonna require leadership. It's gonna require hard work. It's gonna require uh, some intelligent people to get involved and try and steer it in a credible direction. Because uh, if it does simply remain an angry rabble yelling at the wall, it's not going to go anywhere. Uh, I, I think you'd be mistaken in believing that, you know, uh, an, a single meeting of uh, Wexit is somehow going to be indicative of what an independent Alberta would look like. I, it, just as a political rally for environmentalists is not necessarily what the, the liberals will look like. Um, so there's, it's a long road ahead for this. There is no guarantee that they're, that they're going to break through, but I think some of the cons, some of the planets have lined up so that if, uh, some of, some of the right ingredients do come in, it, it is going to be able to break through. Alberta has a very long tradition of populist or insurgency or anti-establishment movements breaking onto the scene and very quickly coming to power or coming nearly to power as the original Wild Rose did. So uh, it's far too early. I'm not going to put my money on it right now because it's going to be up to this group to, uh, to come together and show some political maturity and that it can go beyond, uh, go, go beyond angry rallies at this point. Derek, thank you very much. Really appreciated this. We have had an adult conversation, even though we didn't disagree. And I think that public uh, political discourse in Alberta would benefit if there were more conversations like this. So thank you very much for doing this. That was my pleasure. It was uh, funner than I thought. <laughs>